James Flynn is an expert shot. A black belt in karate. Fluent in four languages. Ciao. Hola. Bonjour. Hello. And irresistible to women. Oh, James. He's also a heavily medicated patient in a Los Angeles psychiatric hospital. Flynn believes his locked ward is the headquarters of Her Majesty's Secret Service and that he is a secret agent with a license to kill. When the hospital is acquired by a new HMO, Flynn is convinced that the Secret Service has been compromised, infiltrated by the enemy. He escapes to save the day, and in the process, Flynn kidnaps a young orderly named Sancho. This unscheduled day trip turns into a very real adventure when Flynn is mistaken for an actual secret agent. On a remote island hideaway, paranoid delusions have suddenly become reality. And now it's up to a mental patient and a terrified orderly to bring down an insecure evil genius bent on world domination. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> That's the way to start a show. Harris Orkin. Well, that oh, was very, I'm good. That was very impressive. It was great to see that. I haven't seen that for a while. Dude, I just want to say, first of all, how in the wide world of thriller novels does a guy get permission to use a character as iconic as James Bond and rip it off into a story like You Only Live Once, which is a fun read? <laughs> Well, it's it's parody, so you know it's satire, and I don't ever actually say the name, you know. It's just someone, and and honestly, I kind of based it on not just James Bond, but I was such a fan of all those shows in the like late '60s, as a, like an 11 year old kid, um, you know, Man from Uncle, just you know, all of them. So yeah, Secret Agent Man, yeah, but James Bond was the uh, was the paradigm for sure. Um. I, I love it. Uh, by the way, folks, uh, you only live once. It's yeah. Just imagine as the promo just played, imagine uh, James Bond ish in a uh, psych ward. You, it, what I like about this book, I'm just going to say this out of the gate. <laughs> Harris is the fact that, you know, your brain having grown up on James Bond, uh, uh, completely buys it. You pull in, you completely buy it and you kind of forget the fact that the guy's a Looney tune, but it's just a good, fun read. It's This is what I call the perfect, uh, I guess, beach read, weekend read, you know, kick back, relax, have some giggles, and still get a little bit of espionage at the same time. So kudos to you, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's just supposed to be fun, you know? Yeah. I, uh, I love uh, comedy thrillers, and uh, and I just want to, you know, and honestly, I, I, don't, I don't think I could even write a straight on thriller it's just my brain doesn't work that way it, it goes towards the comedy i think so all right well before we get started i want to comment on your t-shirt because i'm a huge fan of t-shirts that has oh. to be the dude as da vinci is that it that's exactly what it is yeah it's it's kind of the dude is kind of my spirit animal really so <laughs> <laughs> oh i love it oh uh, one of the best <laughs> movies of all time the big lebowski I know. It's one of those ones that I just, whenever it's on, I'll just start watching it again. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. The dude abides. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's, uh, for, for my listeners and viewers on YouTube, let's talk about how our paths cross. Now, here's a fun little uh, tidbit of information, folks. Harris's dad, Dick Orkin, is a, was a legend, rest his soul, legend in the commercial world. And I discovered him, this had to be, 85, 86, I'm doing afternoons at WNIC in Detroit. And uh, and I, I discovered him and his comic talents. Uh, I'm going to stop there and let you tell me about him because uh, just a legend in the biz. Yeah, you know, he, he, he had such an interesting background. You know, he passed away about five years ago, but he did teach me a lot about writing comedy. And I actually, I worked for him for a number of years writing commercials. So that's kind of how I learned to write uh, comedy dialogue working for him. But he, he was a, uh, he's worked in radio in, uh, you know, all around the country, uh, KYW in Cleveland, WCFL in Chicago, where he, 
he created the Chicken Man show, <laughs> which was, yeah, which yeah, which was really it's you know fantastic. And I, I was like a teenager, and I would help him work on that too as well. Spent a lot of time in the studio with him. <laughs> but he, you know, he had good act. He had really great acting chops because he, he went to Yale Drama School. He was, uh, you know, he was he was going to be a serious actor. He, he, uh, he, he went to. He, one of his classmates was Roy Scheider at Franklin Marshall College, and they would do all the shows together. And, uh, and strangely enough, my dad would play the the very serious stuff, and Roy Scheider would always play the comedy. So that that, that changed later, didn't it? But yeah. uh, and then he went to Yale Drama School, and uh, but I was I came along. And uh, he needed to make a living. And uh, so instead of going to New York, he started working for a radio station in Pennsylvania. And he continued with his radio career, you know, and he was in, he did news and public affairs and, uh, and uh, you know, and then ended up doing Chicken Man. And then from there, that's when he started doing, after he left WCFL, he started a company where they started doing comedy radio commercials. Um, and uh, with a guy named Bert Burtis, it was called Dick and Bert. And, yeah, uh, Dick and Bert. Oh, yeah. man. And it took off from there. They did ads for Time Magazine and just all kinds of like really big companies. So, you know, and I was, I was like a teenager, and I, you know, through college I'd worked there. And uh, he, he hired a lot of uh, people from Second City because we were in Chicago yeah. to work as writers and performers in the commercials. And, uh, and then he came out to LA like in '78, and uh, and it was fun for me because I got you know I was I was doing some work for him, and we had like some of the best actors in Hollywood, comic actors in Hollywood coming in, Jack Riley and Kenny Mars. So I got to work with all these like kind of like comic geniuses, um, and uh, it was just you know it was hard for you to write a bad script if Kenny Mars and you know was doing it for you. So. I'm trying to remember when, when was the, when did Dick and Burt really skyrocket? What year was that? Ballpark me. I think it was probably around 1978, 79, okay. uh, maybe a little bit before that. And they moved, you know, that's when they moved to California. They got an agent with the William Morris agency. They both, they got hired. They were on the Tim Conway show for, for like a season. I think it only lasted a season, unfortunately, but um, yeah. But they, you know, and then they split up, but they kept working on their comedy radio spots. Yeah. So did you, you must have played a lot of both uh, Dick and Burton Radio Ranch spots when you were at the, yeah. Radio Ranch. I mean, Dick and Burt, Radio Ranch, these are such fond memories because I was one of those kids that wanted to be in radio ever since high school. Well, yeah, junior high, because I got my first radio gig when I was 16, so... Mm -hmm. And, you know, I heard tell, and that's about the time I heard of him, but I didn't really appreciate it because I wasn't in the biz yet. But, uh, yeah, by the time um, I got, I got cranking, they, uh, they were just rocking the free world. And his, his magic to me was timing. That was the key, which is the key to great comedy. But, boy, that timing between Dick and Bert um, – well, his influences were, you know, the early radio comedy, Jack Benny, Bob and Ray, you know, which I like learned to appreciate. Probably a few people in my generation listened to Bob and Ray and Jack Benny, you know, growing up, but I did. And uh, yeah, I still love all the Bob and Ray routines. I mean, those guys were just amazingly very funny, very deadpan. Yeah. You know who reminds me of them, and then we'll get on to your book. Oh. Who reminds me of them? And I was, tr wife and I were traveling recently uh, on the road, and I flipped across, must have caught them on satellite. Is um, Bob and Tom? Hmm, I don't know them. Huh. Radio guys out of, I think, you know, Chicago was such a, a powerful force for radio. And when mm. I went, I left Detroit, went to Chicago, spent mm. about five, six years there, had three different shows, and. Oh. Um, Chicago is just kicking ass, but Bob and Tom has that same Dick and Bert timing. Uh, you can tell they're pals. They've been together forever. They finish mm. each other's sentences. Anyway, that that whole background is magic, and I have to believe helps you launch this prolific career, creating 
of voiceover business and scripts and gaming. Let's, you know, let, let's spend a second to talk about that because, you know, sure you have an MFA in creative writing. <laughs> but, I didn't know what else to do. So I, <laughs> yeah. But let's talk about that day job of uh, day job. I doubt that it's now because you're probably, you got too much other things going on, but that double R studios in uh, Sherman Oaks. I was reading about that this morning mm -hmm. and I'm always looking for a studio to work with. So now that I know, and it's still there, I, I got to, it is. Yeah. yeah. My, my uncle actually is like runs it day to day. So yeah. Cool. That uh, it's, it's so nice to find a studio in, in Hollywood ish and uh, be able to work with, but let's talk about that. How, how did you trans, how did you go from creative writing to, to uh, gaming and uh, that whole world. Oh well, um, I uh, I had a son, and he would be playing. He'd like to play video games. I'd be playing video games with him. And one of the things I noticed playing the, his games. So first of all, I really enjoyed playing the games with him. And this was like the mid '90s. But the um, the the uh, writing and the voice acting was like horrendous in them. A lot of them, anyway. And, uh, you know, and I thought, boy, they really could use someone who knows how to do this. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of reached out. I started going to gaming conventions. I went to GDC, Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, and to E3 in Los Angeles. And I just started networking and meeting people and told them, you know, and basically kind of selling my services as someone who could cast and direct voice talent. And so I started getting hired doing that. But then they, uh, I would be sent scripts that were really pretty horrible. And, you know, up to, you know, I was a screenwriter at the time. I was working as a screenwriter as well. And uh, I offered to, like, rewrite the scripts for them. And from there, I started getting hired by companies to, like, conceive the stories with them. And, uh, you know, I started 17 years ago writing video games. So, and, and so it's really changed quite a bit since I started. You know, before it was very, like, minimal um, graphics in terms of like facial expressions. Yeah. You had to write like you were writing for the theater because as if people were sitting at the, in the back row of the theater, they couldn't really see the faces. So the voices had to do all the work. Right. But now it's like full on animation with facial capture, facial motion capture. And so, you know, the actors can emote without using their voices as well. So um, it's just like writing movies, honestly, you know, and that was my, that's when they talk about my math, so it's my background writing uh, film scripts. So, um, I, you know, I just, and it's, writing games is a lot different than writing movies just because they're so interactive and uh, players have a lot of control of the story. So it, it required a, kind of a, an adjustment to my thinking how to do it. Um, and the, the other thing is no one had really figured out how to do it exactly yet either when I started. And not only anyone has yet either, but there are some games that just have amazing writing and acting. And uh, I know you're, they're making streaming shows based on games and, then, and they're much better than the movies based on games used to be because game stories were pretty thin before. And now, you know, there are a lot more, the characters are a lot deeper and there's a lot more um, complexity to the stories. So like the Witcher um, series based on these fantastic games from Poland and, a, and a, a series is coming out on HBO called The Last of Us based on a game uh, that was done by Sony. And that was an amazingly written game. It won the Writers Guild Award for, for best uh, game script, which I, I was nominated for, but that was like 2012 for, uh, I did a game with Tim Curry, Jonathan Price, and uh, you know, it was just, it, it was like an amazing cast actually, yeah. I so, am, um, <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, I'm amazed at how gaming has, uh, you know, we grew up, like you said, the cartoons were flat and one or two dimensional, and now they're, you have to, you have to look and go, is that, is that real? I mean, it's, it's off the charts, which makes me wonder how long it will be, especially with this move of AI infiltrating everything. How long is it going to be before it's so real? You can't tell the difference. Yeah. It's interesting. There's still that uncanny Valley with that kind of uh, CGI animation where it doesn't quite feel real. But uh, with the facial mocap, I record, like when I record games in the studio, they wear these like rigs on their heads. 
and uh, and it captures every expression. And uh, it's look, it's the, you know, it's their face. It looks like a movie. I mean, you know, when you see certain CGI movies now, it's very hyper realistic. But and the same companies that do the movies are also work on the games. It's become one big thing at this point. Um, the, where did uh, I hear? Where did I hear the statistic that the money of gaming, if you took, I'm, I'm going to kind of hatch at this, I think, if you took all of movies and major sports combined, gaming far surpasses that as far as income. It does. It's kind of amazing, especially because it's kind of a limited audience still. It's not, yeah. gen, you know, um, it's not like, you know, people... Our, you know, our age, for the most part, aren't, though it's changing, aren't gamers. Um, though the average gamer now is like in their 30s and 40s. It's not, you know, what, like it was when we were teenagers, when right. it was just teenagers. Um, it's just becoming much more mainstream. Um, you probably haven't looked at a video game in a long time, have you? They're like uh, one of the newer ones. I'll be honest with you. Uh, and I'm going to sound like a real, uh, I don't know, either a nerd or a dumbass here. One or the other, take <laughs> your pick. I have never really played those video yeah. games. I don't, I don't, I think because I just got too many other things going and I have a feeling, especially if it involves like race cars or anything like that, I have a feeling I would be one of those guys who would be sucked in and, you know, the wife would come home one day uh, and go, what have you been doing all day? I've been right here, you know, doing <laughs> this all day. My, th so yeah, yeah, I'm not injuring I'm not your sure. thumbs. Probably <laughs> you have thumb issues. Um, you know, it's to me, it's just another uh, entertainment medium. It's like watching streaming shows on TV or you know movies or, and so it's and it's it's generational too. I think um, you know, not many people in our generation are gamers. It's, you know, there's a few, but it's a small percentage. You go down, you know, like my son is 32 and him and his girlfriend, his wife and now at this point, play games all the, all the, you know, they play them all the time. And it's just something they do besides watching TV or whatever else they do. And they're, they're both computer programmers. They're kind of into nerd culture. So they're really into it. So. Well, when, when I saw this proliferation of guys sitting uh, at home playing the games and then playing it uh, and, and then broadcasting it in real time and then oh, people yeah. watching that and those audiences getting huge. Uh, it just shows my ignorance. Cause I'm like, what, wait, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to sit and watch you play your video game. <laughs> you know what? It seems crazy to me too, honestly, but it's become a competitive. And I, and I, one of the ways I got into working in games Beyond the way I got my first break was I'd be playing with I was playing with my son a lot and um, and he always kicked my ass. He was just much better than I was. So I would stay up late. I'm very competitive. I'd stay up late at night when he went to bed and I just keep practicing. And I got really good at this one game called Soldier of Fortune 2 and so good that I was like one of the top 100 players in the world. And I got recruited into like clans to play in matches. And, uh, and so I met the people who created the game and I found out I was a screenwriter, the guy who wrote the game and asked me if I could help him find contacts in the screenwriting. And I said, I would if he could help me find contacts in gaming. And so we kind of exchanged uh, contact people and uh, I took a lot of people out to lunch and that's kind of how I got my first job. Wow. <laughs> so, I, but I'm not, you know what? It takes a lot of practice. And so it's very competitive and it's like a sport. But it's a sport where you're just sitting on your ass, just moving your hands. So <laughs> you don't stay in shape that way, Harris. I don't know if but, you knew that or not. But, you don't. But, but, you know what's interesting is the professional gamer guys who do it are in really good shape. Um, they 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 swear that they have to stay in good shape to be able to do it, and they and you kind of burn out at it at, by age thirty. You've like lost your your ability to be that fast. You know that twitch, those fast twitch muscles start to fade. Sure. Well, I, I say a similar thing to writers. I, when I see writers who, this is just my own personal opinion, yeah. when I see writers not take care of themselves because 
we are often sitting at a desk for hours and hours and hours on end. I'm like, you're not doing yourself any favors if you're not constantly stretching and, you know, yoga or working out, which I do all of that stuff because I found myself, it was, I was a couple of years into it and I was, I found myself doing this, getting that, you know, that kind of a hunchback. And I went to a chiropractor, dude, what do you do for a living? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I, I sit like this all day long. <laughs> So we started doing training to keep your shoulders back. I won't go into all that, but point being, you got to stay in shape because your body, you know, body in motion stays in motion and you keep your brain waves percolating. Yeah. I, I feel like writing takes a lot. Of, I mean, my wife thinks this is crazy, but it take, I feel like writing takes a lot of like energy. And so I need to be like, feel like I'm in good physical shape and full of energy to sit down to start writing. If I'm not, I'm not full of energy. Nothing is coming for me, you know, so. No, that's why I'm a yeah. big fan of working out early in the morning, hit the gym mm. about 530 and then start writing, you know, shortly thereafter. But, you know, speak, there's a couple of things that I want to uh, cover as we get into this because <clears throat> the James Flynn escapade. <laughs> so my logical question, as we sit here, talk about gaming and, and I just love to get it immersed in your world uh, besides, so we got, uh, you only live once you got once is never enough gold hammer. How about this as a game? You know, it's, it, it would be a possibility, you know, if, um, but, um, infringement. Yeah. Well, no, no, I, oh. I could, I could like pitch this to a game studio and see if they'd be interested. Honestly, I, I think they would be less like, they'd rather have like a bigger, like, um, IP, I think, to work with if they're going to sell it like that. Though it, it's possible you could do this as a game, but writing a game is, like I said, is very different than writing a book. Where the book, I have complete control of where the plot goes and it's a linear story. With a game, you have to give the player some choices and directions, so it's it's not as much a linear story usually. Um, but it could be. It could be a game. There's no doubt. I mean, uh, The Last of Us, the one I told, is a very kind of a linear story. And you'll when you if you'll probably watch see the HBO show when it comes on, and uh, and that worked great as a game. So wait a minute, know, what 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 HBO what? It's called The Last of Us. Okay. And it's I think it comes out early next year. You mentioned that earlier. I just want to make sure yeah. I wrote it down. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, no, it could easily be a game. But you know, it's if, if the one thing, great thing about writing a novel, and you know, I, I was I worked as a screenwriter for a long time, so I was kind of in development hell for a long time. <laughs> a oh, yeah. lot of projects, <laughs> lots of notes from studio executives. Yeah. When I'm writing the book, I, part of the reason I started writing books is, I, you know, I, I just wanted to do something that was just mine. Yeah. And not, and not have to, you know, everything else I do is a collaboration, which yeah. I enjoy doing, but I wanted something that was just for me. And yeah. so that's why I started writing the books. And, I totally uh, get that. Yeah, I totally yeah. get that. And, you know, to switch in midstream again so let's take this away from a game and turn it into a movie or a tv series because this would be a great like you mentioned at the top of the show about <coughs> excuse me the man from uncle and and those shows and those were those series were weren't they half hours because i mean our no they were at least the man from uncle it was an hour and uh, i think and so was um like uh, Secret Agent Man. Yeah, so were, basically 40, I spy. Yeah. Yeah, 44 to 48 right, exactly. minutes. So my point being, this would be a great, great series. I mean, I'm looking at, you know, this is the world of streaming. We sit down and we just binge all this stream stuff, and this would be so perfect. Well, I it did recently, the series got optioned by a, by a TV production company called uh, Avalon Entertainment which is based in the UK. And I actually had a couple studios interested in it, which honestly surprised me. I didn't, I didn't really seek that out, but it was mentioned in this, there's this monthly newsletter thing called the, uh, <clears throat> the optionist. And they kind of each, each week, they kind of uh, tell studio executives what, what uh, IPs they think would make good, movies or TV shows right. and somehow they found my book and they put it in and, and they got a lot of attention. And, um, and so I got, I got some offers and uh, we ended up going with uh, Avalon and it's, it just happened. So, you know, nothing's, nothing's happened yet in terms of actually any, you know, 
moving towards production. And having been in the movie business for a long time, development can take a very long time. So, you know, I may be quite elderly by the time people see it. But, uh, um, but, it, but I, do, I do think it would make a great series. Honestly, I, the, before I wrote the book, I wrote it as a film script. And I had optioned it years ago, and uh, and I really love one of the scripts I love the most, and uh, but it just never got made, which is true of a lot of projects, and so I did. That's part of the reason why I decided to write it as a book, and I got so much deeper into it when I decided to do it as a book. You know, it's such a different medium as well, and uh, I think it improved honestly. Um, and being able to write a series of books and kind of get deeper to the character each with each book. It's been good. So yeah, I'd love to see it as a series and well, hopefully you, that'll happen. So you make me think of uh, Mark Graney, who's been on this show a number of times. And he said the last time he was on, he goes, David, you have no idea. The gray man, which came out with Ryan Goslin, was optioned a half a dozen times mm. sent in to turn around a couple of different times. I think it's about 10 years it's taken. Wow that to get on the screen and now because of the integrity of his um, caliber of writing and the heft of that story and now with the heft of that bankable star behind him i think the rumor is they're going to make that a, an ongoing series like it's going to be the next jason Bourne thing oh like a yeah. film series yeah i saw that and i'm a fan of his book so yeah i thought it was a and I actually read about how they changed it somewhat for the movie compared to the books. Um, sometimes that's good. Sometimes not, I think. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something. Yeah. This is a great tangent to take about 60 yeah. seconds on because I pers I agree with Mark. Mark said this. He goes, uh, I was ma I make it a comment about, and this relates to you as well. Hey, what do you think about Hollywood taking Gray Man and kind of diverting some of He goes, dude. I wrote my story the way I wanted to write it. I sold the book, Happy Trails, and then it, they come around years later and they want to adapt it to what story they want it to be. Go for it. And I was like, that is so refreshing because you hear so many people go, oh, you took my story and it distorted it. <laughs> no, your story was your story. And uh, the gist is still there, yeah. but it's kind of like, it's kind of like Jack Reacher in the Lee Charles series, right? Uh, everyone's like, oh, but Tom Cruise is so little. And then the new guy comes out. Oh, he's a huge guy. That works. I'm like, it's adaptation, dude. I mean, aren't you just. <laughs> yeah. Though like, I have to say, I did like the ser the uh, streaming series better than the Reacher movies. Honestly, I because I couldn't get the idea that Reacher was gigantic out of my head. So, uh, you know. And 99.9% .9 <laughs> of other people said the exact same thing. But, you know, the. And, and I think his attitude is the best attitude to have because once you option it and give it, hand it over, you don't really have much say so, you know, and you'll drive yourself insane worrying about trying to make it. But in, in, in my case, because I, you know, I was a screenwriter before I did, I did, well, you know, they know that I'm interested in helping that part of the process. But even then I know you know, it's a different medium. It's going to have to change. And, uh, and that's fine, honestly. As long as it's as good as it can be as a streaming series or a movie, you know, it, you know, it just has, it's its own thing. And I know it, like, you know, I have the books no matter what. I've done it the way I want to do it, and they'll always be there no matter what. Yeah, I think it's a little on the myopic side to sit there and uh, worry about that when, when, when they could say... Oh, oh, you don't like that? Oh, we'll take it back. You know, you will give it back to you. I'm like, no, 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 no. I love your ideas. It's great. Honestly, the other thing for me, you know, because I'm not as I'm not anywhere near this, like, you know, as, as some of these writers you interview. I love your, by the way, I love your podcast. I love, Thank you, you know, some of my favorite uh, thriller author, authors have been on. Uh, and I'm nowhere near their level. But so what this will do for me, if they actually do do a series, it'll sell a lot, help me sell a lot more books. You know, it'll really, it's the best advertising you can be, really, so. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, anyway, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make one more comment and then I'll move off of that. It, it, I remember when I first got into radio in the major markets, uh, it was Detroit, and a ball, I, I got written up in um, page six 
because I was hanging out with some people that were, um, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and, <laughs> mafia. Anyway, and so the guy, uh, my boss said, dude, no worries. You know, I was worried. Oh, wh what happens when that hits the Detroit Free Press? Dude, any press is good press. And from then on, I'm like, you're damn straight. So I say to you and the people go, oh, but I want, I want a different deal. Dude, just be glad somebody wants your deal. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'm, it's better just to let it go. You know, I, I think ca casting and all that is important for some, especially something like, like, like my series. But it's true of anything, really, right? That's why you know, um, Cruz for me wasn't as good. I mean, remember the actor, the new actor's name, but I thought he was kind of great. Alan you know, Richson. Oh, Alan. Yeah, he was really good. Speaking um, of which, uh, uh, speaking of which, Andrew Child. Next week, one hundred. I know that's episode. so exciting. I can't believe I'm on the week before. Honestly, um, yeah, I've read. I've read. Uh, I think they've done two together now, or more. Or there's been more. But I've uh, read, you, I read. Andrew and Lee. You mean? Oh, they, yeah. uh, This is number five. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, side note. Speaking of which, so Lee has written a book every single year since '97. Yeah, I read I I read a book about the writing of one of those Reacher books. Did you read that? It, it was uh, he worked with, as he wrote. I forget which book it was. He worked with a, a writer, and the writer kind of uh, went through the whole process he, he uses when he's writing a book. I found that really fascinating. Oh wait, uh, yes, yeah. Break that down for me because I can't recall the exact details. It was that, like I, I, don't, I don't have the details either, but it, I, it was about someone kind of just going through the whole process with uh, with him uh, from the from the inception of the story all the way through the writing to the end, and just how he goes about doing it. And he's a, you know, they talk about pantsers and you know, otters, yeah, right. And uh, and he he really seems like a pantser. It's like the way he did it. I just like I I can't write like that. It was just interesting for me to read. I could never keep everything straight in my head if I just made it up as I went along. Um, I have to outline it. Maybe because I was a screenwriter. I don't know. I think it's good protocol. I think yeah. um, I have heard that <clears throat> September. Well, I want to say the. Maybe 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 Labor Day weekend or maybe the Monday right after Labor Day, he sits down that's it. and he yeah and he just rolls with it and he just goes until he finishes it and that's it. And I I do think it's off the top of his head. Now then you talk to his brother, and he's much more. He likes a little bit of outline and structure so that he kind of keeps the details straight. Yeah, um, but when you're writing with writing partners, and I learned this from Andrews Wilson. You know, one guy has a specialty that this is this is his thing, and then the other one is this thing, and then when they come together, it always works. So, I, dude, whatever works, right? Yeah, no, I would. Uh, yeah, I've never written. Uh, I've written screenplays and plays with writing partners. Everything, every everything except um, I haven't written a novel that way. So, well, I, yeah. it does beg the question: What's next? for James Flynn. <laughs> well, I just turned the fourth book into my publisher and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, I don't want to go too deep into the story yet because uh, it come, probably won't come out till next summer. But uh, it, it, the story said now Flynn is in this um, mental hospital in Pasadena, which is a pretty benign place. And the, yeah. and the, and the people Rosemary. there who are, yeah, his fellow patients are kind of quirky and and uh you know and troubled but they're not dangerous in the slightest bit so in this book flynn actually ends up getting sent to a forensic mental hospital in in california a state hospital that holds like the it's like serial killers and spree murderers and so now he's like dealing with much different uh type of uh type of uh, fellow patient so Nice. And that's coming out when, do you think? Uh, next summer. Okay, got it. Yeah. By the way, as I flipped open the book, I just noticed Juan Patron um, does your cover design. He did. He did the cover for that. He did a great job, I thought. I love these covers. Yeah, the reason I he caught my eye is he did 
he did a book cover for someone else. And I'm like, oh, who's this guy? And then he and I became Instagram or Twitter oh. fans and uh, friends. And yeah, just, just great. Dude, everything about this is, uh, you know, I, I, I want to, for people who go, oh, is it like James Bond? Like, it has an influence of, but it's more fun fun yeah. being funny so yeah i mean honestly i based it on uh, when i originally came up with the concept i wanted to do a modern day version of don quixote so that was my <laughs> right so that, that was my initial inspiration and uh and i thought rather than being a knight errant who would who would don quixote be if he was existing today and you know honestly he'd probably be a superhero but it, you know from my perspective in my formative years that superhero was james bond yeah. So I just thought, you know, he would think he's James, you know, someone like James Bond is super spy. Yeah. And uh, and that's what you know, in, in a way, uh Bond and all those kinds of spies are kind of knight errants. They go out into the world and you know, rescue damsels in distress and and, and save the world, you know. So it's pretty similar. Hey, before we start to wrap up, I do have a question. What do you think about? It? I just read in New York Times recently that the um the people behind the James Bond series is they have decided to go with like a 30 year old guy instead of, you know, there was Idris Alba and a couple of other guys in the running, yeah. but now they're thinking about going younger because they want to, you know, project five, 10 plus years down the road. What do you think about that? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Sean Connery was 32 when he started. Um, yeah, so you know, I think they've done that previously in the books. Uh, you know, he's there is in his 30s, so it makes sense that if they want to start and they're going to reboot the series, they would want someone that they could go through a number of you know films with without yeah. aging out of it. I think like Roger Moore by the end was looking a little um old to be hanging out with like 20 somethings. So, um, you know, it got, it, got, it got a little creepy actually by the end. <laughs> So is that your um, daughter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we get to our fun and game section, I'd like to ask you what I ask all my authors. And since you are a fan, by the way, thank you for the very nice mm. comments. If you, uh, you know, I, I want to hear your best piece of advice for all would be writers out there listening to the show. Well, uh, you know, I've, I've listened, you know, as, as I am a fan, I've heard other people and I've heard other people give the same advice. And I would say and it's the same for me. It's persistence. It's uh, you just have to be persistent because it, I mean, you know, look at me, I'm, it took me a long time to get to a place where I had like a, a novel series. And I've, you know, I've gone through a lot of different parts of, uh, you know, a lot of different writing careers to get here. And it just took a long time. Even when I was a screenwriter, it took me seven years before I sold my first screenplay. So you just have to be persistent and you know believe in yourself and you'll get better because you're doing that uh, you know that uh, 10,000 hour rule 10, where you, hour. yeah right so you you kind of learn your craft so it's really to me it's just it's mainly about persistence so Superb advice. And you know what? I don't know why anybody thinks that they can master something in less than uh, a couple of years or so, or 10,000 hours. I'm like, and I always say this, especially to my golfing buddies. I'm like, did you pick up a driver, head yeah. out to the T driving range and, and crush it straight 300 plus the first time? No, of course not. So, but yeah. after, uh, years of that, you get better. So anyway, well, excellent advice. Well, it is time for rapid fire questions, which, you know, we, <laughs> We have to play a little bit of this, and I right. think you'll be the perfect person for it. <clears throat> All right, you wake up one day to find yourself locked inside a video game, something you have uh, uh -huh. experience with. What character would you most like to be, and what weapon would you use to get out of a sticky situation? This can be serious or preferably funny. Okay, well, I'm going to pick one of my own characters who who is... Uh, <laughs> uh, Sam B. from uh, De Dead Island, who was a, a one-hit wonder rapper, who was just was great at killing zombies, and he had a uh, he had a combination shotgun chainsaw. Uh, <laughs> so when he ran out of shotgun shells, he would use the chainsaw part. So that would get you most out of most situations. Oh, jeez. <laughs> 
Okay. In a similar move, James Flynn has called to invite you to join him fight the evil warlord who is seeking world domination. What is your secret power? Hmm. Wow. Um, I would say uh, mind reading. <laughs> oh, and, because you can anticipate every move. Right. I can know what he's going to do. I know. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can plan far ahead and anticipate everything. Now, that's clever. I have yet to hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to a writer. Okay, yeah. good. All right, finally, if you could land, and this is more kind of introspective to the guy, you know, our age probably. Mm. If you could land the quintessential Hollywood or literary gig, I don't care what it is, the world is your oyster. What would it be and why? Hmm. You mean if I could... Are you talking about me like writing a franchise? Working if you could, if you could snap your fingers, and whether it's you know James Flynn or fill in the blank, and you know you could you could think of oh, what would the ultimate dream be? Snap your fingers, and it happens. What would oh, it be? Oh yeah. Well, I, I would love to be able to write and direct a James Flynn movie, big a big budget movie. That would be really fun. Honestly, have you ever directed anything before? I have short, short, but short things, short pieces, sure, and uh, nothing at uh, at this scale. Though I direct, I direct all the video games I work in, I, I and I direct in the uh, you know in, in the mocap and the sound stages for mocap. So I, I do, you know, I do a lot of directing for those. And if you, yeah, I'll have to send you some clips of some games so you can see how how advanced they are and how much they look like kind of blockbuster movies at this point. All right, folks. If you'd like to learn more, visit harrisorkin.com. And as you'll notice, uh, as the font will say below, 1R in Harris. Follow him mm -hmm. and uh, James Flynn, of course, <laughs> on Twitter at Harris Orkin. Dude, this has been so good. And it's so cool to have had you, you know, I feel like I have known you uh, before from the association with your father and then the way we've just kind of communicated via social media. So it's, it's, been cool getting to know you even better. No, it's nice. I hopefully I'll, I'm going to be going to Pochacan, uh this coming year. So hopefully if you're there, we'll be able to meet in person. I look forward to that. Yeah. Oh, I'll be there. Dude, that's just right down the street. That's about 20 minutes away. And uh, I, people were asking me if I was going to go to this past one in Minneapolis. And I'm like, no, why would I do that when I can just wait till it's right down the street? <laughs> that's why I'm going. Yeah. And Comic-Con is right down the street too. And I'm sure, I know you get your hands full of that. I do. I've been on panels at Comic-Con quite a bit, actually. Um, I didn't go this year, but I'll probably go next year. Well, once again, Harris, I wish you huge success. The book, again, is You Only Live Once, and it's a hoot of a read. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks again to Harris Orkin and the book, You Only Live Once. It's a fun read, folks. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, next week's show introduces you, in case you haven't seen her on this show before, Wanda Morris. She's going to come into the studio and talk about Anywhere You Run, yet another page-turning thriller. This young gal knows how to write, and she's delightful with a capital D. So I hope you'll join us next week. I'm David Temple, your host. I'll see you then for another edition of The Thriller Zone. Oh,